Now we want to take a minute and look at our rectangular shapes, which also include cubes. And we want to see what the differences are between them from a magnetic standpoint as it how, and how it might affect your application. For instance, the first one I want to start with is one that's three quarters of an inch long and a quarter of an inch square. It's a very common magnet and you can get these magnetized in one of two ways. One is through the length. Now let's take a look at what that does for us. We only have one fourth of an inch square facing each other. So if we're going to hold something, really all we have working for us is one fourth of an inch square. You can also get them magnetized across the width, which gives you a, an area that's three-fourths of an inch long and a quarter of an inch wide and a quarter of an inch thick. So it has a much greater holding power because you have three times the surface area and you didn't lose anything by going to a quarter of an inch thick as opposed to three quarters of an inch thick if you think of it that way. But a lot of people use these because sometimes you may have a sensor that you really need to reach and you're a long ways from it. If, you're on, if you've got something in between you and it, you need that extra thickness to penetrate an additional distance if you had a sensor picking up. And we deal with people that need things like this because they're inside of vats or, or things that have got floats inside and they're trying to determine level and do level detection, a magnet like this has a good application because it can sit on the outside of three quarter inch thick uh, fiberglass and probably reach through it and give enough so that the sensor can turn on and off. Now we're going to take a look at another one. This is where we look at one that's one and three quarter inches long by half inch wide by a quarter of an inch thick. This one gives us the advantage of the quarter inch thickness, which is very good against most metal sizes. If you're going with something that's one inch thick, you can take advantage of a thicker magnet. But if you're going with the standard stuff that's sheet metal or the thickness of a board or something like this, this is going to be perfect for you because you get one and three quarters of an inch long and half inch wide, which is a lot of surface area working for you. It is so hard to pull this off the board. That's why I keep it stuck to the side where I'm only getting part of the benefit and I've got a way to pull it off. Now we're going to talk a minute about cubes. Cubes come up all the time. A cubic shape is really very good for us because a cube gives us a way of getting the maximum magnetic field distribution out of a unit volume. One of the things to know is if I take this four millimeter cube, the surface of this cube gives me 4,700 gauss. It's four millimeters thick, four millimeters square. I get 4,700 gauss on it. But if I take three of them stacked together, I only get 4,900 gauss. What I wanted you to realize from this is going longer doesn't get you something unless you needed that 200 gauss. If the 200 gauss made a difference to you, then it's worth the difference. But you tripled your cost and you only went from 4,700 to 4,900 gauss. Very small gain for that. Sometimes that's what you need. Most of the time you might want to do something a little different. Now we also have this one, which is two inches, two inches long, one inch wide, three-eighths of an inch thick. This is an extremely powerful magnet. This is the kind you might use in windmill applications because if you look at this and how it interacts with a coil of wire, this one is going to put out a strong enough magnetic field through the thickness of this wire that you're going to get an optimum amount. Now obviously this magnet is a lot smaller than this coil of wire, so you wouldn't want a wire coil that size. But as the magnet would sweep across it, it's going to be able to penetrate through the copper and on the back side of the copper be adding enough flux lines to the copper to make it really worthwhile and get a good trade-off for a massive magnet and size of copper for producing power. There's also a lot of great holding applications for it, but I wanted to talk about something a little different on this one. Now we're going to get and, and focus on our attention on the really large one. This is one of our most popular magnets, believe it or not, and it comes with the serious body part crushing warning on it. This would crush anything. You, before you get one of these, we really insist that you watch our safety videos on how to handle these powerful magnets. It is impossible for you to imagine how fast things can be attracted to one of these magnets. They really project an enormous field. It's like a magnet sitting in the middle of a beach ball as to their sphere of influence. It can be up to a foot away all the way around. It'll cause something. And what people usually hurt themselves doing is reacting from all of a sudden they see something take flight and they know it's coming at their magnet and when they jerk away they sometimes can fall and hurt themselves. Other times if you get this, if you get fingers in between two of these, 
you don't have those two fingers anymore. Uh, you just, there's just not really any way to overcome that much power with a magnet. So you think, why would you use something like that? If you look at a magnet like this in a windmill application, you might think, that's the magnet I need. Well, yes, it will produce more magnetic power through the coil than the other one did. But you are getting, you have put so much more power into it you got such a gigantic magnet and you have got such high flux on this side, you're wasting most of it. To use a magnet like this, you would need a coil almost as thick as the magnet to get the maximum benefit from it. And that would be very expensive to put together something like that. If you look at this as a comparison to the one that I had up here earlier, I won't handle both of these at the same time. But this two by one, surface area wise, only has half the surface area. If I look at the thickness, this is 10.6 times the volume of this magnet, but it does not produce 10 times the magnetic force that this does. Now, if both of these magnets were put against a piece of one inch thick steel, this would be a probably 10 times as strong as that is. So where do we use an application like this? One of our favorite applications for this comes from a customer we have who makes different devices. They're basically robots and he uses the magnets to hold it onto the side of a ship or to hold it onto the side of a silo or a tank and this magnet puts out enough force to hold that buggy in there even though it's putting out 6,000 psi of pressure with water jets and it's got all the hoses and everything hanging from it. He uses an array of these. So that is an application that really fits a magnet this powerful. Most people just like to get them to say they've got a giant super powerful magnet. Be very careful. Pick the magnet that suits your application. So what I wanted us to look at with rectangles and cubes is how do you pick the right size for your application? And it depends on what your application is. What are you holding against? What do you want the magnet to do? Or are you using it in power generation? How much power are you planning on generating? How much magnet? You don't want to overbuy the magnet. You don't want to buy a two inch cube and you're hoping to make 300 watts of power out of a wind generator. It's a big mismatch. You want to get the right magnet for your application.